So on the night of my 18th birthday, I left. In spite of the consequences I knew I would face. In spite of the consequences I knew I would face, I left. I knew no other way. I didn't belong there and I knew if I stayed, it would destroy me. But even as I left, a part of me was convinced that I would be punished for denying the God of my father. Years later, I began my search for the God of mainstream Christianity. I had heard this God was kind, loving, and gentle. But when I peeked behind the curtain, I discovered again the God of my father with his attitude of exclusivity. This God did love everyone, so much so that he would punish them for eternity for rejecting that unconditional love or for expressing their sexuality in ways that he disapproved of. I began to ask questions, hold leaders accountable for their answers, and eventually discovered that there was no legitimate evidence for these claims of God. I've always been inclined to require proof. Somehow that remained intact throughout my childhood and beyond. I'm no longer willing to, to live my life believing in things that can't be seen. I don't accept arguments that defer to faith when challenged. Freed from the shackles of ancient prejudices, I can embrace the morality of equality for all people. No longer bound to a vision of life eternal, I can focus my mind on making here and now better. Absent proof that we continue on after our death, life becomes more precious, and the way we treat one another becomes more important. Letting go of the idea of God subjected me to an entirely new barrage of criticisms and false claims. While I can't speak for everyone in the atheist community, I can tell you that no, I don't hate God. I once feared him, or the idea of him, but now, how can I have emotions for something that doesn't exist? And I don't hate religious people. In fact, a beautiful aspect of humanism is that it makes no claims of punishment or retribution for those who would deny it. I am indeed very critical of theological ideas, but I don't hate the adherents. And let me say this, I don't hate my family. I hate the cruelty and harm they cause their fellow humans. And I detest the message they preach that would marginalize and dehumanize a class of people for who they choose to love. But I don't hate them. And this idea that an atheist believes in nothing, what does that even mean? Here's a few things that this atheist believes in. I believe in the demonstrative ability of science to unlock the mysteries of our world. I believe in the power of music and art to elicit passionate emotions. I believe in kindness toward others. And I believe that actions speak louder than words. Finally, what about this claim that atheists are immoral? We could argue all day about the source of morality, but the hard evidence that confronts us every day is that the practice morality of non-theists is at the very least indistinguishable from the faithful. If you have an issue with my atheism, challenge me on my basis for rejecting the idea of God. Please don't insult me with these claims. They're shallow, dismissive, and appeal to the lowest common denominator of humanity. Today I base my beliefs and morality on ideas that are grounded in science, ideas that accurately predict the world around me, and ideas that advance the well-being of humans. And on this topic of human well-being, I would like to discuss another issue that's near to my heart. The Supreme Court heard the case Snyder versus Phelps in October of 2010. A year ago, they handed down a decision that said my family had done no wrong in protesting at the funeral of Matthew Snyder, a soldier who died in the Afghanistan conflict. The opinion pieces poured off the computers of Americans 
lauding the decision and confirming that our soldiers fought and died for the protection of free speech, even my family's free speech. At the risk of offending some here, I respectfully disagree. I agree that free speech is a crucial component of any free society. I agree that my family is entitled to equal access of this free speech. I disagree that free speech should extend to funerals. Yeah. I believe the discussion has been improperly framed creating a false dichotomy. Consider this. Since the documented beginning of man, we see human societies operating with the assumption of the right to say their final farewell to loved ones in an environment of reverence and respect. The world around us cries out with that attitude. Native American burial sites remain sacred centuries later. Grand edifices are built to honor those who have passed. Rituals in modern times reinforce this heritage of respect and privacy. From an emotional standpoint, this time marks the final opportunity to say our goodbyes, to remember with broken hearts our loved ones. For a fallen soldier, the event is particularly bittersweet in that a life was given with deliberate intent to secure the lives of others. Certainly, these rituals are crucial to the emotional well-being of the individuals and the society in general. Have we become so jaded and or so slavishly devoted to the altar of free speech that we can't see this as a case of competing rights. Certainly the right to bury a loved one in peace isn't enshrined in our Constitution, but it is inarguably a de facto right that we have operated with from time out of memory. And contrary to popular opinion, it's not a foregone conclusion at this point. Although the general understanding is that the Supreme Court has spoken on this matter, in fact, they haven't. Chief Justice Roberts authored the majority opinion in Snyder versus Phelps, and on the specific question of protesting at funerals, he had this to say. Even protected speech is not equally permissible in all places and at all times. Westboro's choice of where and when to conduct its picketing is not beyond the government's regulatory reach. It is subject to reasonable time, place, or manner restrictions that are consistent with the standards announced in this court's precedents. Maryland now has a law imposing restrictions on funeral picketing as do 43 other states and the federal government. <laughs> to the extent these laws are content neutral, they raise very different questions from the tort verdict at issue in this case. Maryland's law, however, was not in effect at the time of these events. So we have no occasion to consider how it might apply to facts such as those before us, or whether it or other similar regulations are constitutional. In other words, they deliberately did not rule on the constitutionality of the various state and federal laws that have been passed. This question is not settled, and I would urge each of you to consider the possibility that what is really best for us as a society is to view this very narrow but tremendously important issue as worthy of an exception to our free speech rights. That it is just and, just and right for us to create a protection for the vulnerable and brokenhearted as they say goodbye to their loved ones. And finally, this venue gives me a unique opportunity to say something to the larger community of service women and men. To those families who have lost a loved one in combat then had the sanctity of their final farewell disrupted by the cruel, hateful message of my family. I wish to express my sincere regrets and apologize for their actions. <laughs> to every service woman and man in this country, to their families and loved ones, regardless of their faith or lack of faith, regardless of the gender of the person they love. From the bottom of my heart, I, I would say thank you for your sacrifice and your willingness to risk this precious gift of life to protect ours. Thank you all very much.